Good morning. We have General Questions. Question one, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government how many women in the last year have been treated with mesh or tape products to treat pelvic prolapse or stress urinary, urinary incontinence? Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. In 2013-14, that's to the end of March 2014, 1,360 women had a mesh implant procedure for either stress, urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse or both. The number of mesh implants includes biological and polypropylene mesh. Finley. The answer the Cabinet Secretary gave was not in the last year, but I understand why. But on the uh, 17th of June last year, Alec Neil told the Petitions Committee of this Parliament and MESH survivors that he was suspending, suspending the use of MESH for, these, for the treatment of these conditions. Yet on the 16th of July, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer Francis Elliott wrote to health boards encouraging them, encouraging them to continue to recruit women onto clinical trials where MESH would be fitted inside women's bodies. Why do MESH survivors who have campaigned relentlessly on this issue feel that they have been completely misled by the former Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say to Neil Finlay that I will be meeting some of the, the women affected uh, on the 23rd of February. Uh, I'm very concerned that women have suffered complications following their surgery and that's why of course we set up the independent review announced by the previous cabinet secretary on the 17th of June. All health boards who carry out these procedures have considered uh, this request and almost all have suspended these procedures. Uh, the review is analysing the number of women who have undergone these procedures in Scotland and the number of complications and from this information will be able to consider the, the level of underreporting, and I will be able to give Neil Finlay uh, figures beyond March uh, of uh, 2014, and I'll write to him about that. I mean, in terms of the issue of clinical trials, the clinical community fully endorse medical research in this field as the most credible way to answer what are legitimate clinical research questions and improve the care of patients. And of course, it's only where women have agreed to participate in a clinical trial that they're fully aware of the fact and associated risks. So no one is uh, going into clinical trials without all of the, the full information. Um, the previous, the, the, the acting CMO did write to all health boards on the 20th of June requesting that they consider suspending mesh implant procedures as Neil Finlay knows and uh, that request to health boards has been framed in the strongest possible terms but of course that has to be balanced against the wishes of those women who having fully considered the risk prefer to continue with this procedure and of course consultants are providing additional counselling and are using the new patient information and consent leaflet developed by the expert group to make sure that any woman who does want to go forward understands the risks. These are difficult issues to balance but I hope Neil Finlay will understand that, uh, that the letter uh, to health boards was in the strongest terms, but individual patient choice uh, still remains as an option. John Scott. Officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the growing number and size of successful compensation claims regarding mesh implants in America. In addition to the pain and suffering caused by these implants, does it therefore give her concern that notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary Alec Neill's instruction to health boards to stop these treatments, some health boards still are using mesh implants, which may leave open Scottish health boards and ultimately Scottish Government to compensation claims. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think as I, I laid out in my previous answer, uh, that the health boards have been given a very, very strong uh, uh, letter from the acting CMO uh, about the, the, the the uh, suspension of this procedure but if individual patients in discussion with their consultant in full knowledge of the risks decide they want to, to go ahead then that is obviously a, a, a discussion the patient would have with their consultant. Meantime of course in terms of uh, looking at the issue uh, more fully the regulation of medical devices including implants is uh, within the, the remit of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, which is the UK body responsible for regulating all medical devices, and they work through with the European Commission on these issues, and they have responsibility for the regulatory framework. We follow the guidance uh, in exactly the same way as other UK uh, countries. 
Evidence is required before suspension is mandatory, and the current European Commission has not proposed a change to that. So that covers uh, that issue uh, to some extent. Should that change, and then of course the situation would change here in Scotland as we would follow uh, that advice. Scotland has written to the uh, European Commission seeking assurances that the results of, results of the research that it's carrying out at the moment will be acted upon swiftly. Um, but as I say, I will be meeting the women, um, some of the women concerned on the 23rd of February and I will listen to their concerns and anything more we can do, obviously we will do um, and I hope that reassures the member. Question two, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards meeting the target of 11% of demand for heat being met by renewables by 2020. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, also, the most recent UK data upon which progress towards a renewable heat target is based shows that in 2012 renewable heat generation equated to 3% of Scotland's non-electrical heat demand, up from 1% in 2009. Claudia Beamish. I, I thank the Minister for his answer and I'd like to um, turn our, our thoughts to actual district heating, if I may. And colleagues on the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee received evidence highlighted in their report to the draft budget this January uh, that uh, Scottish Renewables and others were concerned that Scotland is, and I quote, still very far off meeting its target for district heating and that the committee wished to relay a plea for a step change in investment in renewable heat. Can the Minister tell me his response to that plea and also how many of the recommendations of the Expert Commission of November 2012 are at present being actioned? Minister. Uh, well, I acknowledge Claudia Beamish's interest in this matter. I will look at the evidence given to the EET. We accepted all but one of the recommendations of the Expert Committee. We are dealing to make progress with all of them. I have chaired an Expert Commission on District Heating on the 11th of November. We have a target of 40,000 homes to be supplied with affordable low carbon heat. We are working very closely with local authorities, housing associations and the NHS to deliver district heating schemes. Retrofitting it to existing buildings is uh, expensive, complex and logistically challenging. But we are making progress in Glasgow, in Aberdeen and in Wick. And I want to see, as Claudia Beamish sees, a step change so that Scotland can see, like Denmark, district heating forming part and parcel of the way in which we provide heating for our homes for people in this country. Question number three, Jackson Carnlaw. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve survival rates from brain cancers. The Secretary, Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that people with brain cancer receive the best possible care. Early detection and appropriate timely referral is key to improving survival rates through our £30 million Detect Cancer Early programme and the refresh of our Scottish referral guidelines for suspected cancer. We're working to increase the number of brain cancers detected at the earliest possible stage. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will know that the survival rates from brain cancers are depressingly low, with only 15 per cent of those surviving, and it is the biggest cancer killer in Scotland of those under 40 years of age. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in congratulating my colleague Cameron Buchanan, himself a brain cancer survivor, on the success of the recent gala dinner he organised for the Brain Cancer Charity, which raised just short of £20,000, all of which will go to research. Perhaps even the Finance uh, Secretary will double that before the day is out. But will she agree to contact health departments elsewhere in the UK with a view to jointly promoting and encouraging internationally further research into what is sadly regarded by the pharmaceutical companies as an orphan condition in research terms, in order that we look forward to genuine progress through research into improving survival rates for both brain cancers and other cruel conditions such as motor, motor neuron disease. First of all, uh, can I join with Jackson Carlow in congratulating Cameron Buchanan on the, the work that he's done around this uh, absolutely uh, very important and uh, I, again, I think highlights the importance of research. Very happy to also write to the other health departments around uh, a coordinated approach. What I can tell the member is that uh, the, the Chief Scientist's Office recently announced funding of uh, £225,000 for a, a research project led by Professor Anthony Chalmers at the University of Glasgow. Uh, which is due to start shortly and the purpose of the project is to evaluate the clinical potential of a novel treatment strategy um, the most for one of the most common and lethal adult brain tumours. Um, 
Obviously, I'm sure the member will know that most cancer research in Scotland is not funded by the CSO, but by Cancer Research UK, who do a huge amount of crucial work in this area. And of course, we uh, provide the CSO provides funding of around £440,000 a year to the Scottish Cancer Research Network. So there is some good work uh, happening in this area. More can obviously be done. I'm very happy to uh, write to the other health departments to see whether we can coordinate further action. Question number four, John Finney. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to encourage industry to move from road haulage to rail freight. Minister Derek McCann. The Scottish Government is committed to encouraging the transfer of freight from uh, road to more sustainable modes, including rail. That is why, in the current rail funding settlement to 2019, a £30 million Scottish Strategic Rail Freight Investment Fund has been made available over and above the funding for the rail network as a whole and the separate freight mode shift grant schemes which continue to operate. Taken together, this substantial package of investment and funding will help encourage growth in rail freight and support our vision for a greener and more efficient transport network. John Finney. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that res uh, response. The Far North Line carries nuclear fu fuel, unfortunately. It is no longer to able to cope with existing or indeed potential traffic. Oil tanks travel to Laird 75 per cent fuel due full due to restrictions on, on one of the viaducts. Lower platform wagons to take uh, higher containers have been banned due to track conditions. What is required is dynamic loops, faster points and improved signalling. Will the Minister agree to press network rail to significantly improve line speed and capacity on the Far North Line, please? Minister. Uh, yes, I will. I will look into the specifics of that case. And certainly there are rail improvement works that working with network rail we will proceed with on the line, but if there is further pressure required, I will certainly apply it. Question five, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government if they will order a review of the National Accommodation Strategy for Registered Sex Offenders? Minister Margaret Burgess. The Care Inspectorate and HM Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland are carrying out a review into how well the public is protected by the current multi-agency protection arrangements for assessing and managing the risk posed by registered sex offenders in our communities. This will include an assessment of how effective the responsible authorities are in the discharge of their statutory duties, including adherence to national guidance such as the National Accommodation Strategy for Sex Offenders. When the review is completed later this year, a report along with the appropriate recommendations will be published. Paul Martin. President officer, since the murder of Mark Cummings over 10 years ago, uh, I think the word review has been used on a number of occasions. Now, President officer, I think it has been recognised on a number of occasions and as a result of a number of reviews that have taken place that sex offenders are disproportionately allocated housing in deprived areas, in particular in Glasgow. Can I ask the Minister, is that still the case today as we speak? Minister. What I would say to the member, and I do understand and appreciate his concern and his long-term concerns on this matter, but housing registered sex offenders in the community is an important part of the risk assessment process. The location and the type of accommodation will always be determined by the circumstances of the individual offender and the risks that they may present to the community. Rod Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Current MAPA guidance indicates that registered social landlords do not have to assess and manage the risks, but have to cooperate with those that do. Does the Minister believe that current guidance is adequate in relation to registered social landlords? Minister. As the member uh, indicated, registered social landlords have a duty to cooperate under the MAPA arrangements. Their role is to contribute to the responsible authorities' management of risk by allocating housing that has been assessed as manageable for released offenders. The extent to which the duty applies in practice will depend on the nature of the accommodation that any landlord has available and the extent to which the responsible authorities consider that such accommodation would help to manage a risk in any given case. Question number six, in the name of Lewis MacDonald, has been withdrawn. Uh, the member has provided an adequate explanation. Question number seven, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for pupil assessment in schools. Minister Alistair Allen. We are committed to improving outcomes for all children and young people in order to raise attainment that is important to be able to demonstrate success and identify challenges in order to understand where improvements need to be made. That is why in schools teachers already gather evidence on pupils' progress across a range of learning and both the Scottish Government and local authorities are always looking at good practice wherever we find it. 
Michael McMahon. I thank the Minister for his response, but does the Minister agree that there can be no uh, dispute there's a, a, there is a significant difference in attainment between children in Scotland's most deprived areas and those in better off parts of the country? All of us want to see progress being made in relation to closing that gap. It has existed for far too long. So can the Minister tell us how he intends to measure any improvements, especially amongst primary school pupils? Minister. Well, I don't, I don't think there will be any disagreement uh, between the member and I about the importance of closing that attainment gap. I think uh, it's long been acknowledged that one of the, the central aims of Curriculum for Excellence and one of the central aims of this government, indeed, uh, is to ensure that everyone has an opportunity uh, to succeed and fulfil their full potential. Schools uh, are always uh, measuring uh, their progress on closing this gap. Uh, I've, for instance, uh, been... Uh, uh, in conversations with Education Scotland about the role of school inspections around this area, uh, and also there are uh, many uh, um, there are many other activities. For instance, uh, Insight, the, the benchmarking tool, allows uh, schools to make meaningful comparisons uh, with each other about what they are doing to make sure that their policies and our policies are all centred around closing the attainment gap where it exists. Question number eight, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with its partners about railway timetabling and capacity in the North East. Minister Derek Mackay. We meet regularly with Nestrans, the regional transport partnership for the area, and other partners representing issues in the North East to discuss a full range of railway issues, including timetabling and capacity, and the next meeting with Nestrans is currently taking place. Kevin Stewart. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. In 2013-14, uh, North East stations accounted for 3.35% of Scotland's patronage, compared to 2.44% in 2004-05. And there has been significant growth at all eight stations, notably Port Lethen, 350% growth, and Inverurie, 290% growth. In the case of Inverurie, we've seen we passengers question, rise from 128,000 in 2004-05 to 500. Come on, get to the question, Mr Stewart. Can the Minister assure me that growth will be taken into account when rail investment resources are allocated? And can he commit to looking at increasing station numbers, rolling stock and services in the North East so that rail patronage can Minister. continue to grow? Hey, I can, presiding officer, give that reassurance. Uh, we have uh, accepted there were issues with the current franchise in terms of demand and that's why work was in place for capacity and crowding issues and we'll do more of that with the new franchise. And there are commitments around stations, journey times, uh, reliability uh, and new rolling stock as well and I'm sure that will be the answer that the member sought. Well the answer was a lot shorter than the question. Question 9, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to introduce new initiatives to help people with chronic migraine disorder. Minister Maureen Watt. All, all clinicians in NHS boards in Scotland are expected to be aware of and adhere to guidelines published by the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network. Sign Guideline 107, Diagnosis and Management of Headaches in Ad Adults, November 2008, provides clinical guidelines for the management of headaches, including chronic migraine. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her response. Is there any new money being put aside for this research? And is the government aware how widespread this disorder is and how often it leads to prolonged absence from the workplace? Minister. The Chief Scientific Office has responsibility for encouraging and supporting research into health and healthcare needs in Scotland. Uh, the CSO responds primarily to requests for funding research proposals initiated by the research community in Scotland. We are not currently funding any research project on the cause or treatment of chronic migraine. However, we would welcome research proposals in this area, which would be subject, of course, to the usual peer and committee review. I'll take Margaret McCulloch. Question 10. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the review of out of hours GP services in NHS Lanarkshire. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government is liaising with NHS Lanarkshire and being kept uh, abreast of progress with the review of out of hours services in their health board population area and would expect the outcomes of the review to be in line with and any recommendations arising out of the Scottish Government's recently announced national out of hours review which is to be led by Sir Lewis Ritchie. Margaret McCulloch. 
NHS Lanarkshire intend to make their out-of-hour service more centralised than their a &E service? Are the Scottish Government concerned that this could lead to extra pressure on a &E from patients presenting, presenting themselves at emergency rooms who are better dealt with in a primary care setting? Cabinet Secretary. To Margaret McCulloch, that of course the, the consultation is ongoing, and it's very important that the views of the public uh, in Lanarkshire are listened to. And uh, as part of that, of course, with the national out of hours review that I referred to in my initial answer, that any emerging uh, direction of travel and findings and recommendations, uh, we would expect NHS Lanarkshire to uh, come into to line with those recommendations with their local out of hours review. It is important that any steps that they take around out of hours uh, do not uh, impact on elsewhere in the system. And of course, we would be probing that very carefully indeed. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Keza Dugdale.